We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, you can pass that on to your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Hey everyone, welcome back to the MindMate podcast. Uh, I'm right in the middle of recording the audiobook for my third book. It's, it's the final book uh, that culminates the past four years of writing and uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm genuinely about halfway through. So what I thought would be a really cool idea was to release a few of the chapters uh, on the podcast um, to get you nice and excited for the book when it actually comes out. Uh, so this one's all about intrusive thoughts. Um, as many of you know, I've um, been managing obsessive compulsive uh, disorder. I don't really use that word, but I'll use it for this case um, anyway. Um, for 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 most of my life, certainly um, since I was uh, since I was twenty one, when the onset of a panic attack kind of brought it all into and uh, brought it all into a fruition, and I that kind of what's that that is what really started me down this journey into understanding more about the mind and from pain uh, purpose was born and I'm excited to be studying psychology now um, uh, back at university so that's that's really cool that's a nice little add-on to to counseling as well but yeah intrusive thoughts are a major component of obsessive compulsive disorder and um, it's uh, it's a funny one you know often people who have um, OCD or people who don't have OCD rather will say they have OCD because they're, you know, prone to being quite orderly or they like to clean the house. But there's, there's a major distinction between being orderly and clean and having obsessive compulsive disorder. And the only real difference is, um, well, there's two things. A is compulsions. So what people with obsessive compulsive disorder will do is they'll be afraid of something happening or the thought of something happening. And then in an attempt, in an attempt to mitigate the risk of whatever that thing um, is happening, they will act out a compulsion. So for mine, um, I, I had a Catholic upbringing. I was always quite afraid of the idea of eternal suffering and hell and all these ideas. And that's why I'm so interested in the psychology of religion and studying spirituality from a secular perspective. And that's why those ideas um, permeate my, my books. But uh, yeah, my, mine was uh, picking up rubbish um, around the street on my way home from school. I can remember doing it. I can remember walking past rubbish, um, past a, a primary school near my, near my old house where I used to live in Melbourne and standing there for, for 10 or 20 minutes. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was quite a while looking at the rubbish and, and, and thinking, this is so stupid. Why, why do I need to do this? But then the fear saying, if you don't do it, you're going to go to hell. So you get lost in these mental binds when you, when you have these kind of obsessive compulsive uh, behaviors and intrusive thoughts. And the major difference between that is you can be orderly and it's nice to have an orderly house and clean and all that kind of thing. But is fear prompting you to do it such that if you didn't do it, you would feel that something bad is going to happen. And that's what I always tell people. And there are lots of times, Obsessive compulsive disorder can uh, morph into something that's called pure O, where you just have the intrusive thoughts. Anyway, I get a lot of uh, uh, when I was when when I was counselling full time, I had a I was privileged enough to work with a lot of people that struggle with obsessive compulsive disorder, and uh, I wanted to write about it, and I wrote about it um, in the form of this chapter, and I was always trying to figure out how I could put this chapter into the book that I'm writing or the book that I'm just about to finish now. This book is all about um, the subjectivity of trauma, and I've kind of laced it out um, through a series of essays that move in from psychology into a spiritualization of uh, politics and philosophy into the healing modalities, awareness and integration. So there's kind of everything in this book and I'm really excited to release it. But this specific chapter, it's in part one of the book, is uh, it, 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 it brings to mind an anecdote um, and it's all about a lady named Debbie who is struggling with intrusive thoughts and obsessive compulsive disorder. And what follows is a dialogue between her and her therapist 
And as they kind of talk, her therapists promptly uh, just gently nudges her towards this recognition of being able to, I suppose, stand back from the mind and have a look how the mind is saying yes and no and arguing with itself. And um, what follows is a kind of lovely realization for Debbie. So, um, yeah, I'm really hoping that you enjoy this chapter. And uh, if you get, if you like this chapter, uh, you might be interested in having a read of the book when it comes out, hopefully within the next month. So it's really exciting. Uh, guys, just a very quick uh, sponsorship session. Um, I go through ISBN services for all my book stuff and the guy there, Josh, is absolutely brilliant. Uh, he takes care of everything, essentially, from as soon as all you have to do is write the book and, you, and, and, and edit it. But if you're not sure how to take the next steps, ISBN services will do everything for you from interior formatting, uh, ISBN registration, exterior graphics. Uh, it basically turns your book into a professional product in any format, paperback, ebook. Uh, the audio book is something separate, but, uh, but ISBN services takes care of everything. And I, I love working with them. And uh, if you're writing a book, and you're particularly interested in taking the next step, you can use the checkout code MINDMATE for 10% off, which is pretty exciting. So yeah, hit up isbnservices.com for all your book stuff there. Guys, without further ado, enjoy the episode. Bye. Chapter four, overcoming intrusive thoughts. Debbie was a woman of 46, a funny old thing. She meant well, even to herself, yet always seemed to pick the short straw. Debbie loved her children and couldn't stand to hear them cry, but their crying used to come about at the worst times, usually when Debbie finally found time to herself. For Debbie, life happened to her, not for her. Debbie was a downer, a victim to the unfolding of circumstance without any say whatsoever in how she might react or even better, surrender to the need for control for peace of mind's sake. Unconscious of all this, the more she tried to control life, the more it appeared to do the opposite of what she'd intended. And so it went that the more she tried to control, the more she felt afraid she'd lose control, which is to say that she never really had any control to begin with. She knew a thing or two about life. She knew how it worked what to expect and what people should expect from her. Life's hard and that's just the way it is. C'est vie. Life has no meaning and that's bad. Debbie was quite the talker. She was an English major at university and was well read in philosophy, art and the humanities. She was particularly fond of the pessimist types. She was fond of their philosophy because, well, they were the only ones brave enough to tell the truth. Deep down, however, Debbie was smarter than that. She'd studied truth and psychological projection theory. She knew that the mind labels and puts things into boxes. The mind categorizes and states whether things are good or bad. But her mind, however, having decided that her life wasn't any good, couldn't get around itself. It couldn't get beyond itself to view itself objectively. It could not see what it was doing because it was blocking itself from living up to the truth. Not the objective truth, but the reality of her own downtrodden, bleak, subjective experience. Debbie was in the shits, but that wasn't her fault. That was the way life was. One morning, Debbie declared she'd had enough. She couldn't take it anymore. She told herself, meaning that there was a Debbie and a self she decided to make an ultimatum to, that enough was enough. She'd been dealing with incredible anxiety lately, and it had taken a turn for the worse whilst watching TV not three days ago. Newsflash. Residential townhouse burns to the ground after tenant leaves gas oven on. Bang. Panic attack out of nowhere. Debbie the downer was now Debbie the warrior. Debbie split off into a world of psychological projections, of fire and brimstone, death and dying, burning and rubble, soot, ash and pain. There lay her friends, family and possessions, everything and everyone she'd ever known, dead on the ground. She was not in Kansas anymore. She was in her mind, trapped because the thoughts were so intrusive, so painfully real. A consultation with her psychologist was imminent. Michelle, who 
prefers Shell, was delighted to see Debbie. Believe it or not, Debbie was one of her more favourable clients, a kind woman, an honest, intellectual woman who, in Shell's opinion, couldn't quite grasp the dangling carrot. She was so close. If only she could, funnily enough, stop trying to grasp. If only she'd relax a little. But of course, how do you tell someone not to think of an orange duck? Debbie walked in sternly, but Shell could see it was a facade. How have you been doing lately? Shell was genuinely interested. Terrible. What kind of a question was this? Debbie couldn't believe the nerve. Did Shell, who was normally so kind and warm, really think that that was a viable question? I'm here to see you, aren't I? Surely you can't think I'm absolutely drowning in positivity. Shell was taken aback, but her professionalism helped her bite her tongue, and Debbie did have a point. Such a greeting, I can understand, would appear rather patronising, so I do apologise. Tell me, what's been happening? We haven't spoken in a while, Deb. This, Debbie could accept. She gulped down what appeared to be kilograms of air, as though it was her first after having swum to the bottom of the sea. There were biscuits on the table, Tim Tams and shortbread. Despite what the angel on her shoulder fervently suggested, she took a handful. You do realise sugar is the worst thing for someone like you, an anxious mess, and don't get me started on the two coffees already vibrating through your nervous system. Shell, having realised Debbie was probably lost in thought, prompted her again. Uh, how's the family? Listen, Shell, I have this constant fear I'm going to leave the stove on, and by doing so, burn the whole house down and everything inside it, including my family and cat. I never leave my home. I'm struggling now as it is. I must get back to check and make sure I've turned all the power points off. It was Shell's turn to gasp for air. All of a sudden, the biscuits on the table appeared much more enticing. She took a Tim Tam and, before taking a bite, asked Debbie how often such thoughts arose. It never goes away. I can't get rid of it, swirling around my head like pancake mix. Shell, you have to help me. But does your checking actually help? Does the checking ensure the house remains stable or does it merely perpetuate the fear? Debbie was stumped. She couldn't tell if her fear was getting worse, catalyzed by the words coming from Shell's mouth, or if perhaps the metaphorical angel perched on her right shoulder had been right about the Tim Tams. Perhaps it was the sugar starting to take effect. She was on her third after all. It can't be the sugar. Time for a fourth. Debbie grew up in a world that glorified rationale and condemned emotion. Debbie was a baby boomer, a pig in a python. Worldly spirits were high. What a time to be alive. What blasphemy to even consider negativity. How could one possibly experience resentment, shame, fear, unease, or confusion in such times? No, the ordinary ups and downs of childhood were simply disregarded, simply pagan, amidst the positivity and peace post-war. So whenever Debbie announced that she felt like a child, that she felt nervous before her first day of school, or confusions through puberty, she was shut down, told to shut up and get over it, because she had no reason to complain. If only she'd known what life was like in the early 1940s. Had she considered the lives of her parents? What a coddled, arrogant, self-obsessed, self-righteous, dim-witted and ungrateful child she was. To feel emotion, honestly, what was a world coming to? As memories of her childhood sprang forth from the recesses of her mind like water flooding large containers, just as the ooze of warm chocolate from her fourth Tim Tam painted her insides as a dark brown, Debbie felt safe. She knew why too, having completed some good work with Shell on the topics of emotional eating and external validation. Truth be told, the pantry and fridge gave her the love she never received from her parents, but the issues surrounding her childhood, at least peered through a psychological lens, came to a close in one of her earlier consultations with Shell, albeit some latent behaviour remained. It is much easier to understand why change is necessary than to actually change, and most people, Debbie thought, justifying her apparent starvation and sudden need for chocolate, simply stopped at understanding. Debbie knew she'd learnt not to trust herself, learnt not to listen to what her body was telling her, and emotions were now a forgotten, irrational language. In fact, that is precisely what they were. Irrational, therefore ridiculous. 
Shell, Debbie thought condescendingly, was all about them, a fragile duck, and yet she was paying her good money to talk. Or maybe these were the most expensive Tim Tams she'd paid for. Who's the duck now? It helps with the fear. Debbie was back in the room. Shell knew she'd gone off somewhere and was happy to allow it, not because a temporary work break attracted her, but because she knew Debbie needed time to process what she'd said. Debbie was one of her favourites, lost in her head, trying to think herself to a peaceful oblivion. Debbie reminded Shell of her little sister, although she kept her professional distance with the woman in her room, scoffing chocolate, reflecting that of a recently liberated prisoner of a war. Shell's sister was four years younger and was, up until the day of her death, an intellect. She thought about everything, questioning herself and those who agreed with her, a character trait sadly on the out, consumed by a world of social media and political popularity contests. But when the cancer spread to her brain, she lost her identity. She enjoyed thinking, and when her ability to articulate wonderfully transcendent streams of consciousness was lost, so too was her raison d'etre. She died shortly after. Shell lost her greatest friend and teacher. But as luck would have it, two years ago, Debbie requested her consultation and their professional relationship filled a gaping hole. Client needs counsellor, just as counsellor needs client. Some would oppose the relationship, but both parties would testify to its validity and importance. I know it helps with the fear, Deb, but the very act itself validates the necessity of the fear. Can't you see? Do you understand that? I do, and deep down I know that, but reassurance is a temporary aid, a drug, a warm delight, a hug like a fucking Tim Tam. Shell didn't like to push, It was unnecessary and frankly unprofessional. She knew her clients and was well versed in Rogerian dialectics. Additionally, motivational interviewing was her forte and she'd had a soft spot for its practice since childhood when her dad, also a psychologist, would use it to help her resolve arguments with her sister and to find the will to complete her schoolwork. He was open and honest with his tactics, inviting Shell along the way to repeat back to him what he'd say so as to confirm both were on the same page when it came to relevant subject definitions and the eradication of disingenuous psychological projections. Shell loved her father and looked forward to their Sundays, talking about clients over peppermint tea. I can't help but check the stove, and now lights around the house seem to derive some bizarre relevance. I know we discuss fear's associated response to anything remotely or hypothetically connected to the worst possible outcome, but Shell, surely you must know how hard it is to actually do what I know I should, what you say I should. Of course Shell knew. How many times do you check the stove before you are sufficiently sure it's turned off? No number suffices. I can stay seated by the stove all day, which is what I do, unless of course it's time to check the lamp on my bedside table. Then it's a quick run to the bedroom. Shell was now ready to push a bit. She knew it was time, time to lead the fear to the cliff face, have it jump off and die into submission by what her sister used to call the mental double bind. Do you own a kettle? Yes. Have you ever worried about the kettle cord short-circuiting? Debbie's heart fluttered a little. Her fifth Tim Tam, oddly enough, now left a sour taste in her mouth. I never thought of that. Shell almost seemed to be enjoying herself. It's a possibility, Deb. It's a possibility for me too, and God knows how much I like tea. But I must accept that possibility entirely in order to live a life not as a servant of, but acquaintance to, that little thing we all like to call fear. You see, Deb, by not wanting something to happen, the consideration of its possibility and subsequent acting in accordance with the not wanting not only perpetuates the fear, but makes it worse. Any action influenced by either fear or desire, emanating from pain or pleasure, perpetuates the endless cycle. Shell looked at her statue of Gautama the Buddha, sitting under the Bodhi tree, pre-enlightenment. She thought of her spiritual conversations with her sister, and how they used to try to snap each other into enlightenment. They wanted to see each other for who they really were, lifting the veil of illusion, of Maya, to see each other bare, not through a projection of the way they'd prefer the other to be. Oh, how Shell missed her sister. But of course, one could not peer into the truth behind Buddha's eyes 
without forgetting that the now, the wondrous present moment, was the only thing that really mattered. The present was and is the only real thing. Debbie was quick to remark, Yes, but there is a possibility, Shell. You know this. The house could fall to pieces. It could be my fault. That could really happen. Shell felt like repeating herself in a different way. Yes, but you worrying about the house burning down and your subsequent behaviors and compulsions only makes you worry more. We are talking about the fear here, not the actual worst case scenario. That's a thought in your head and a typically violent one at that. There is too a chance that my house could burn down if I left the gas on. But the difference between you and I is the worrying validated by actions arising from and out of fear. It has nothing to do with the house or the stove, only the worrying. So you're saying I just stop worrying and throw caution to the wind. Acceptance and allowance, despite the onset of fear, reduces it over time. It's not that we want the house to burn down, rather we must learn to accept that life unfolds of its own accord, whether we like it or not, whether we agree with its plan or not. Imagine for a moment what life might be like if there was nothing you could do to save the house from burning down, whether it actually did or not. You'd have to learn to live with that margin for error. It wouldn't be pleasant, but eventually it would become the new norm. Some psychologists speak of exposure therapy, edging closer to fearful thoughts through action, and that can help, but it still validates the fear because the subject matter is still, after all, attached to what we are, paradoxically, attempting to move away from, the fear. So I would say, rather than entertaining such thoughts akin to observing for minutes and hours a burning house, Debbie twitched in her seat, how about we come up with some unrelated yet meaningful goals for the next six months? This was far too simplistic for Debbie, who was now experiencing stomach pains from the Tim Tams. Still, she appreciated Shell's sentiments. By not wanting the house to burn down, you have become obsessed with its potentiality. Conversely, by not worrying about it, the worrying goes away. You only worry about it burning down because it hasn't yet done so. There is a chance, but the chance is the same as anybody else's. There is only a possibility that the house might burn down because it hasn't yet, like right and left. You can't win either way. No matter how many times you try to get over the fear, the fear remains. So what do you do? You can try and release the hope of protecting your house from a fire because the risk of it burning to the ground will never cease. And if you give up all hope, you will come to realize that the fear itself was made worse by your actions, which seems far-fetched but true. By not wanting something to happen, it happened incessantly in your mind. By allowing it to happen in your mind, the fear goes away. And none of this has any effect whatsoever in what is happening in the real world. It's all going on like a movie in your head. This made complete sense. Debbie could see how her actions were simply making her situation worse. But to renounce them entirely would take a leap of faith fit only for Bible bashers, and she was an atheist. Debbie looked outside through the window, radiating the sun's heat in the left corner of the room. A rainbow of light flickered on the mantelpiece, refracted by the glass, acting as a prism, separating the white light, producing each of the wavelengths. The view was nicer than before, nicer because her head was less cluttered. The trees were greener, and they waved softly in the wind like hippies dancing, beckoning her to join in on the fun. What did those hippies know? Debbie felt like she was missing out on something big. It was in Shell's eyes, whatever it was, and in the eyes of the Buddha statue, and in the motion of the trees. She didn't know what it was, but it must have had something to do with whatever Shell was banging on about. There was an ease to it, a calming effect. The calling, or was it a surrendering, to relax. As Debbie sat there pondering, time ceased to exist, and for the first time, she felt alive, finally separate from thought, like a dog let off its leash. She no longer was thought, merely an observer of thought. Debbie, bewildered, looked back at Shell. After all these years, she finally realized who Shell was, who she was being, who she had been all along. Shell was a mirror, but now the mirror was polished. Shell was never separate. 
Shell was who Debbie had made her out to be. But now Debbie was no longer doing, only being. And in this very brief moment, Debbie saw the Buddha. Debbie saw what the Buddha saw. She saw what the trees saw and why they were dancing. She saw the refracted sunlight everywhere. She was sunlight. She was love. She was truth, no longer able to hide behind her transient lies. Debbie was free from her mind. It was a servant now, no longer a master. Accept and allow. Don't distract and avoid. The more we try to avoid something, the more it appears ever more violently within our midst. Why is this the case? Because in this polarizing universe, one cannot have yes without no, and there'd be no such thing as fear without ease. Furthermore, if everybody were somebody, nobody would be anybody. This is why the Buddhists say that life is suffering. Because if everything engenders suffering, nothing does. Or at least, the state of suffering ceases to exist. Debbie, quite like myself in my early to mid-twenties, entertained avoidance as a temporary reassuring strategy to reduce the painful sensation of fear pervading her soul. It worked a little in the beginning, but the pain came back, oftentimes much stronger too. The more she ran away, the more she spotted reasons to continue to run, and with greater urgency. She ran so far, she trapped herself. There were no more places to run to. The monsters stalked their prey. Debbie hid in every hiding spot in the house. She made a run for the safest place in her humble abode, the upstairs cupboard, only to realize that the monsters were waiting there for her too. Eventually, she came to realize that she could not run away from her fear because it resided in her. She could not escape herself, and that is why she asked for help. No two emotions make human beings react more unconsciously forcing us to run for the hills than fear and disgust. These are the cream of the crop when it comes to the yin of life, the chaos and the darkness. Something that might hurt or kill us, and something that could put a sour taste in our mouths, which might then also kill us, is not to be trifled with. No, fear and disgust do not deserve rationality and logic. Fear and disgust together make for the ultimate villain. We strive incessantly for wins, attempting to avoid losses at all cost, and nothing could be more woeful, dismal, and downright deplorable than exposure to the worst life can offer us, that which we are afraid of, and that which we despise. Human beings are very sensitive to the emotion of disgust. Quote, In humans, disgust is assumed to have extended from having its origins in distaste, then serving as a pathogen avoidance mechanism, and finally entering into the social and moral sphere. Furthermore, in a study assessing moral rigidity in patients with OCD, increased disgust sensitivity, which refers to the degree of negativity associated with the elicitation and experience of disgust, and disgust propensity, which is the frequency and or intensity of which one generally responds with disgust, scores were associated with increased likelihood of choosing utilitarian solutions to personal dilemmas, demonstrating the role of self-disgust in shaping behaviors and decisions in the clinical population. So those of us particularly sensitive to disgust are more in favor of maximizing happiness and well-being, not only for themselves, but for the lives of others, which on the surface appears to be ethical and well-considered. But utilitarianism is unfortunately both ideological and impractical. We cannot avoid the manifestation of the opposites. We cannot know happiness without its socially determined negative other, sadness. Likewise, we cannot expect to win all the time without losing because no game would exist without two potential outcomes. What we can do, however, to reduce our sensitivity and propensity for fearing the world and or being disgusted by it is to practice allowing the world to be as it really is. We, both individually and socially, and when I say we, I mean the individual and collective ego, determine whether things are bad or good. Things in and of themselves are indifferent. It is only the ego who decides what is what, and sometimes those decisions are entirely irresponsible, prudent, and incorrect. But the ego only wants good. It does not like to be afraid, 
nor clearly can it stand experiencing disgust. The ego is self-centered by definition and perceives itself as superior to other egos. In order to transcend these negatives and the ego, we must paradoxically encourage them to hang around. Avoidance is only ever a short-term strategy. After a while, it will fail. Can we learn to feel through the disgust and the fear to something more perennial on the other side? What are these ephemeral emotions and why must they linger if we can simply accept them for what they are? If we cannot avoid feeling negative emotions because our biology will not function properly otherwise, why do we try? Negative emotions aren't bad or good. They just are. The anti-aging industry is worth an estimated $56 billion and is expected to rise to $66.2 billion US dollars in 2023. Why? Because superficially people believe, have been told, a construction of society, that it's better to be young. How can something that is inevitable be better or worse? It just is. Similarly, death is bad because we have made it so. But as Alan Watts, a 20th century philosopher, argued, death is like winter. It comes whether we like it or not. It isn't about being better or worse, good or bad. It just is. Acceptance of change is analogous to the surrender of death. The ego doesn't like change because it doesn't want to, so it clings on to what it can, ideas and thoughts, people, perceptions and experiences, to augment itself. When we think we are the mind, the endless flashes and thought after thought, we cling to permanence. When we identify with whatever is beyond thought, we no longer fear death because, in essence, we have already died. The mind cannot exist within a vacuum. Clearing our minds, for example, is an impossible paradox because the very practice dirties the floor we're trying to clean. Clearing our minds is a thought, the thing we're trying to rid ourselves of. So how about we play the game until the end, allowing as many thoughts as possible to fill our skulls with intrusive nonsense. Only when we allow such thoughts to join in on the fun, welcoming them with open arms, do they declare that the party wasn't for them to begin with. So allowance empties and conscious eradication fills and dirties. By running away from such emotions as fear and disgust, we inevitably find ourselves standing on their front doorsteps. There will always be a yang to our yin, in much the same way that chaos can only be measured and defined in terms of that which is orderly. For every increase in positivity, there is an equal and opposite increase in negativity. Even winning the lottery produces a fear of losing all that is gained. Therefore, avoidance of and blind ambition to win at all costs precedes inevitable, proportionally painful losses, which leaves us desperately running around in circles. Could it be then that the best psychotherapeutic method to help individuals rid themselves of fear and disgust might actually be to encourage psychological intrusions? Imagine if a therapist actually entertained the client's issues and disorders, not merely labeling them as negatives and doing all they could to get rid of them. Imagine if the therapist worked hard to make the intrusive thoughts worse, made them louder and more obnoxious validating them so much that the client actually started to believe the worst was imminently upon them. And in that moment, standing at the edge of the cliff, just when the worst was upon them, the client is freed from the pain because it has been pushed so far that it now appears as ridiculous as trying to bite your own teeth. This is, of course, another extreme option. Running away and voluntary incessant exposure are two sides of the same coin. And that is why Shell requested Debbie think of some intrinsically meaningful goals. Then, and only then, would Debbie be able to drop the coin altogether. Obsessive Compulsive Disorder Debbie was an obsessive compulsive. She suffered from intrusive thoughts, constantly reassuring herself by validating her fears. She checked and watched the stove like a hawk to prove her fear wrong to show herself that the worst would not and could not happen. Little did she realize that her reassurance merely validated the fear as her fearing the house burning down became the fundamental subject matter of her life. She became identified by and as her fear. She was caught in a psychological double bind, a positive feedback loop. She was fighting a war of attrition against herself. 
It was Debbie in the blue corner and her fear, which was also Debbie, in the red. Debbie against Debbie. If only Debbie could see her fear, not as some separate entity, but as an absolutely necessary and even lovely, if she could learn to love it, aspect of herself. Her determination to get rid of the fear merely perpetuated it. But what if she'd leaned into it? What if she'd let it play out? Not necessarily to fight it, but simply to accept it like it were a fingernail. We don't, at least most of us, try to rid ourselves of all 10 fingernails because we accept them as innate to the human organism. But our desire to rid ourselves of fear and disgust, also biologically inherited, has somehow become the norm. It is impossible to live a life without fear, just like we cannot live without dying. We can't win all the time. There will be bad days and sad days. We can strive to be good and better people by allowing ourselves to be open to, accepting of, and humbled by our weaknesses and insufficiencies. We will only make things worse if we attempt to disregard what we, the egos, determine to be inferior, running around in circles until we die, never truly gauging the sanctity of life. In the early months of 2019, my partner and I moved to France to live in the countryside, an hour or so outside Angers. I can remember feeling tension in my chest as we were picked up by our host family, having shared a ride from Paris to Angers. It was an anxious tension because for the first time in my life, I knew the outside world was about to switch off. We were driving out into the middle of nowhere. I had latent childhood fears I hadn't yet completely outgrown. This was the final battle. Subconsciously, that was the truth. Olivier and Bev, two absolutely lovely people whom my partner and I will never forget, provided us with organic beans, fresh croissants, and a cosy apartment to call home after having departed from the Scottish Highlands. We were in the middle of a French winter. The fields were painted frosty white, and our gumboots felt more like bricks than shoes. We fed the horses and the sheep. We were responsible for ensuring the newborn lambs stayed close to their mothers so they didn't lose their scent. Some newborns, usually born in twos or threes, pass away as a result of their mothers forgetting their smell. I'd never lived like this before. At night, the silence was deafening and the black skies were lit up by the stars. For the first time, I saw constellations I'd only read about in books or seen in movies. I was not in Kansas anymore. Although we had access to the internet and to social media, our mentalities were different. My partner and I were no longer in it. We felt a separateness to the rest of the world, a sense of detachment, truth be told, we haven't forgotten, nor desired any less. And so, for two months, we were alone, and I felt alone, left to fend off or finally come to terms with unreconciled issues of the past. I went inward to bring to light the root causes of my deep-seated anxieties. I dreamt I was at my childhood friend's house, cooking some meat on a barbecue for all my football friends. Unfortunately, I burnt the meat. The otherwise joyous occasion quickly turned sour. I felt very ashamed. The boys stopped what they were doing and turned to face me. They were not impressed. They started to gang up on me, my dearest football friends, and chased me to the front of the house. They circled me and began to close in. Just then, I realized I was dreaming and began to fly. I took a few practice jumps, big jumps, then flew far away over the nearby plaza and parks, onwards and upwards to safety. My OCD was sparking up again. Interestingly enough, in the dream, I felt shame doing what I could to get away from the house. I'd given myself a false sense of security, but you can't escape yourself. The dream told me I was attempting to outrun my OCD, but I couldn't and didn't want to any longer. In 2014, I was diagnosed with anxiety and OCD. I was given some labels and I loved them. I held on to those bad boys for dear life, like shopping bags about to break. For some time, whilst my mates were off living it up in Southeast Asia, I sat idly in my room for hours on end. It was the summer of 2013 and I was sending myself crazy with boredom. A major player in the manifestation of OCD is shame. As contemporary philosopher Alan de Botton so eloquently describes, quote, the unfortunate person feels, at some level, utterly disgusting and beyond the pale and will, 
in the background have been feeling like this for a long time. Somewhere in their past, normally as a result of very traumatic and degrading childhood relationships, they will have derived an impression that they did not deserve to exist. Their current thoughts are not plans for the future. They are attempts by the mind to find a match between their basic sense of self and what would be needed by their society to concur with it. They are a move to bring about a form of dreadful inner equilibrium, ensuring that the judgment of the world falls in line with the judgment of the self. So I had a label. I was finally a someone. I knew who I was once again. I was anxious. I was Mr. OCD. I was me again. I tackled this disorder head on. I went to the very bottom of it. In truth, it did teach me a lot about the way I thought and about the mind. I took psychedelics, meditated, spent hours in isolation, wrote in my diary extensively, interpreted my dreams, spoke to counselors, friends, and psychologists. I researched fear-based disorders for years, learned about other forms of OCD and intrusive thoughts, compulsions, and childhood emotional traumas. I was healing myself. I read and read and read for no other purpose other than to get over myself, because although I was a someone a person with anxiety and OCD, I didn't like being me. I questioned myself relentlessly, every single aspect, but no single truth emerged, only greater incremental insights, deeper holes to explore. I read article after article after article. I tried everything. Still, the funny little what-if thoughts persisted. OCD is an unusual beast. Norman Deutsch, MD, explains it from a neuroscientific perspective. OCD patients are hyperactive in the following three areas in the brain. The orbitoprefrontal cortex, the PFC, in the brain, which is responsible for rational decision-making, where consciousness resides. The cingulate gyrus, responsible for emotional processing and sending signals to both the gut and the heart. And the caudate nucleus, which uses information from past experiences to influence future actions and decisions. The caudate nucleus especially becomes sticky, which is why many patients feel as though they can't get it out of their heads, the common description for intrusive thoughts. Ultimately, getting my life back on track helped me more than anything. My application to the present cured my past. Procrastination, blaming, and complacency sparked that OCD. I'd lost sight of what I enjoyed in life. I spent much of my time in bed or in front of the TV, eating too much food like an ungrateful pig. Although I kept fit, played guitar and maintained a social life, I had no job, no responsibilities, and a mind I didn't like. The Paradox of the Healing Journey Acceptance represents detachment from self. We get far too attached to who we are or who we have become. So then we try to heal ourselves by getting equally attached to being someone who is broken. We try to get over ourselves or heal ourselves from the past. This is a great starting point, but a paradox nonetheless, because in order to heal ourselves, there must be a self we are trying to heal. Are we two selves? Attachment to the healing journey is another trap of the ego. This happens a lot, so don't worry if this is where you find yourself. It happened to me in a big way. I mean in a really big way. It's like we finally build the confidence to look inside and take note of that which was suppressed, repressed, forgotten, shamed, feared, or resented. Then our ego deceives us once again. He or she becomes a spiritual ego. We think we're healing ourselves. So in other words, there is a self that we are healing. So who then is the we? We have become the we. We have become the ego determined to heal the self. And all of this, of course, means that we are still attached to healing. So, we move further and further away from the original point of our endeavors. Ultimately, detachment from healing coincides with acceptance of the self. Can you escape yourself? Can you try to run away from a memory, an experience, an aspect of yourself? Of course you can't, just as you can't run away from your own feet. You might ask, should I be feeling this way? But I might ask you, can you help it? Can the sun help being hot? Should a dog not have a tail? We've become so good at rationalizing in this day and age that we now try to rationalize reality, thinking that there could be some other way other than the way it is. And we believe it. 
We get so lost in the rationalizing that we forget the truth. As Aldous Huxley, the 20th century novelist and seeker wrote, quote, belief is the systematic taking of unanalyzed words much too seriously. This was the case for me too. My ego split off so aggressively back in the latter half of 2013. Prior to my initial panic attack, I, for all intents and purposes, was my ego. But then it freaked out and dived into a pool of anxiety. I thought I was anxious. Then I thought I needed to find myself and that I had lost my identity. Again, who was it that lost his identity? Later, I realized that I hadn't lost myself at all. Merely an aspect of myself, akin to misplacing a shoe. Identities are like clothes. We change them all the time, and certain identities are more socially acceptable than others. Ultimately, however, the only identity that matters most is an identity that is entirely congruent with the truth of who you are. Why wear a suit and tie when you're much more comfortable in tracksuit pants? Why wear a suit and tie when you feel it in no way, shape, or form reflects the truth of your being? So I figured I'd dispense with who I thought I needed to be and put on a mere version of me. Accept that you're a flawed human. Poke fun at yourself. Have a bit of fun. Don't take yourself too seriously. Enjoy life because the more you identify as someone on a journey, the further you walk away from the thing you're trying to find. You. All right, team, there it was. That was the chapter. And uh, yeah, if you... If you just have a recollection and have a think about some of the ideas discussed in there. A lot of the stuff I kind of spoke about was the paradox idea. You know, the, the, the more ingrained you get into a healing journey, the more you start to subconsciously perceive yourself as broken. So as Siobhan would say, um, it's all about having that awareness and the best way to cultivate that awareness is through meditation, which is obviously something I need to do a hell of a lot more of, but trying to take that, observer perspective all the time and have a look at how you're interacting with ideas, thoughts, people, circumstances, environments, because if you don't maintain that awareness perspective, uh, you might find yourself lost in that, that double mind thinking akin to what Debbie was going through. So there you go. Guys, hope you enjoyed it and um, reach out to me if you're, uh, I've, I'm, getting, I'm still getting messages um, from uh, episode 136, I think it is, um, about the dreaming. So I'm still getting DMs about um, people analyze, want me to analyze their dreams and stuff. And oh, what does this mean? It's really cool. I'm really humbled by it. So yeah, um, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, hit me up, tom.ahern on Instagram and um, I respond there. So cool. All right. Speak to you next week. Bye.